and welcome to today's webinar, Focus on the Basics During Crisis, Organizational Survival and Sustainability. My name is Christina Gagre Campbell. I'm the Vice President of Communication and Marketing at Independent Sector. I will be facilitating the discussion and hopefully we can stay on time and get to all of your questions today. For those of you who are joining us for the first time on an IS webinar, welcome. Independent Sector is a national membership organization representing a diverse set of nonprofits, foundations, and corporate giving programs working to ensure all people in the United States thrive. I am joined today by a great panel um, of folks, um, Mihai Patru, Executive Director of Caravan Sarai Project, Stephen Bennett, Board Chair of Caravan Sarai Project, Susan Gomez, President of Inland Empire Community Collaborative, and Jeremy Hobbs, President of the Western Wind Foundation. As part of the webinar feature, all of you are muted. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We'll also be monitoring the chat box there. So if you have any questions, either places works for us. The webinar is also being recorded and we will be posting it on the IS website and you will get it emailed to you uh, within 24 hours of the ending of this webinar here. Also, please take the survey at the very end. It'll pop up on your screen as you leave and it will also be emailed to you. And with that, I will turn it over to our moderator, Mihai. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Christina, and thank you, the IS team, for organizing this panel. Uh, I hope everyone had a nice memorial weekend and uh, took the time to take a break from this exhausting, um, two months that we've all experienced. Um, all of us are in Southern California, so hello from here. It's a very warm day. Um, and the topic for our conversation today is really about survival and sustainability of mission-driven organizations. And since all of you have been, I'm, I'm sure have been in this sector for a while, I think <clears throat> what, the nonprofit sector has demonstrated in the last two months has a really high degree of uh, resilience and adaptability. And we've all been very busy at making sure that uh, we provide support to our staff, we uh, have the right finances, enough finances, we've been navigating the PVP loans and took care of our beneficiaries, donors, supporters, everyone. It's been really an exhausting effort. Uh, and on top of that, we always had to keep in mind that we need to survive, but also have a plan for sustainability. And really today's conversation is about coping with the present, making sure that we survive, but also we are able to plan for the future, our future, and that a year from now, five years from now, our organizations are still in business, their impact is growing, and we really provide the best support to the beneficiaries that we, um, we, we target. Um, and we thought about a few questions for our conversation. It's more of a dialogue. So what I want to start with is um, a conversation, uh, a question that really resulted from our experience over the last two months. Uh, we've been, all of us, we've been so focused on our own work, on our own organization. And I think at one point we all get the feeling that we are alone in this. We are the only ones dealing with these major issues. But once we step out of our bubble, we realize that everyone is really dealing with the same issues. And uh, Susan and Stephen and Jeremy, all of us, we've been working together and covering different aspects uh, in order to support uh, the nonprofit sector in the Inland Empire in Southern California, but also around the country. So one of the questions that I, I have in mind to kick off the conversation is, what are the most common dilemmas that you've noticed while working with uh, your partners, also from the perspective of your organization, uh, the common dilemmas that you've noticed over the last two months? And um, I would like to start with Jeremy because his focus for since COVID, the COVID pandemic, pandemic started has been on making sure that 
nonprofit organizations really understand the financial aspects of this crisis and they uh, take care of their finances, they are able to plan ahead, they really know what is happening with the PPP loans and CARES Act. Obviously, we all have to deal with that. So, Jeremy, if you want to share with us some of your uh, of the things that you have noticed since maybe February end of February. Hi, Mihai. Thank you very much, and it's it's nice to uh, be with all of you today. Uh, I think that one of the things that I've noticed is the overwhelming amount of uncertainty. That's the key word I will use for so many of the people who are running organizations as well as everyone else. And uncertainty comes, uh, we, we see it in so many different parts. How is our organization gonna survive? Uh, what should we be doing for money? Uh, how do we provide the services that we've been providing in the past? When is this gonna end? Uh, what can we do? How should we work with other people? Uh, is the federal government gonna step in and provide any sort of guidance or resources to us? Are state and local governments gonna help us? When is this going to be over? And it's just this uh, enormous amount of uncertainty. And I think that no matter how effective a planner or no, how effective an organization, building on uncertainty is very difficult. And that's one of the, the, the stresses that I see uh, constantly. And, and uh, if I can just drop in, one of the things I would suggest is uh, I think that as we, as we move forward, what I'm doing and what I'm suggesting everyone I, I work with do is to look ahead 18 months. Assume we're gonna be in this uncertain environment for at least 18 months uh, and make your plans accordingly. If it's less than that, we're all gonna be happy. Uh, if that, that, that amount of time lets you make some changes during that time frame, but if you, if you think like a lot of us maybe thought in the beginning of March, oh, this will be two or three months, we'll be back to normal. Not gonna be that way. Now we say maybe six months, maybe we get to a vaccine in the January. Don't count on it. I mean, it's great to have hope, but let's build a plan that says, let's look at 18 months. So that's one of the ways I'm trying to help people overcome my own, my own experience, as well as the people I'm working with, that, that uncertainty that I see is so prevalent. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, Susie, uh, you are running an organization that probably is one of the biggest organizations in the Inland Empire. And what's very interesting and different about uh, the Inland Empire Community Collaborative is you managed to develop a system in which all your members are part of a collective and they balance each other's uh resources and they give each other feedbacks while working partnering for the same project uh from your perspective working with more than 90 organizations uh but also uh reaching out to more more other organizations in the region what what have you noticed as common dilemmas that these organizations have been facing yeah, thank you, Mihai, and I appreciate everyone who's on the call today, um, you know, taking the time out of their day. Um, you know, we're seeing with the collaborative kind of work, it kind of has um, fit well in terms of our wheelhouse for the experiences that we have because we had cultivated um, a lot of really diverse um, relationships amongst us. And um, so when the crisis kind of hit for particularly for our organization, it was an easier pivot for us to start then reaching out to other partnering agencies to look at how we could um, leverage the work that we were doing and share resources information. Because at the time that it originally, when it first happened, all of us were kind of scrambling for what's next. And that kind of, uh, to Jeremy's point earlier, I think for the first maybe month, you know, what we've seen here in our region is just the survivability of what's next. How do we continue to provide services and programs for our clients? And then came the reality is, do I have the capacity to do the new pivot to see our clients, uh, not uh, in person, but virtually, let's say. And there's come the, the technology that's required for, for our organizations to have to deal with. But I think the strength of having um, collaboration, there is a lot of pitfalls and people talk about that. And there's a lot of, but I think it outweighs, especially in this environment, the, the, the um, ability for you to kind of benefit from this, um, you know, leveraging from each other. And you can provide better services, better outcomes to your community. You have more 
expertise in the room when we start collaborating with each other. I might not have skills around something with HR, but somebody in the group does. And I think the access to resources and networking right now is really what has made the critical difference for us during this crisis. And, and, and I have to add that both Western Wind Foundation, Caravans Right Project, and uh, IECC, we actually have a partnership going on. And one of our main initial products as a response to COVID-19 has been developing a technical assistance program, helping supporting nonprofit organization navig navigate the PPP loans. And that was launched really early on. And I think by now the IECC team has provided support to over 150 organizations. Right. And this is ongoing and we had organizations from around the country reaching out to this team and asking questions. And what we've noticed was sometimes they just needed to hear, to talk to somebody, not necessarily asking for a very practical uh, technical advice, but really making sure that their challenges are experienced by other organizations, that they are not alone, just get some, increase their confidence. And, and I wanna ask Stephen about uh, this need for mental support for organizations, staff, beneficiaries, especially that he has, Stephen is also on the board of the California Endowment, the Arcus Foundation and Save the Chim. So he can, he has a broader perspective and works with uh, organizations that are spread all over the country. Thank you. Thank you, Miha. Yeah, through all the organizations on which I serve on the board, we're really watching uh, how it's impacting our grantees and uh, the different programs we work with. And we're very concerned about uh, the leaders that you probably you folks on the phone who often feel uh, isolated and exhausted and you've got so many things you need to do and and often some really hard decisions about staffing about layoffs about continuing programs and you're the biggest asset often an organization has and we're very concerned that people really take some time to you know man manage your expectations and and consciously lower your stress levels and be optimistic but realistically uh, you, it's kind of accepting our reality and then figuring out where to go with it um, it's try to get a routine it's so hard for some of our folks who are trying to deal with their kids at home and still try to perform for work and figure out how to do work their organizations often online it's a whole new new world and and we really um, are concerned about being compassionate with yourself and each other and and it's a good time to reach out and so we're often looking at folks and and reaching out and talking to them in different ways partly just to make them feel like you're not alone and there's a lot of people out there and and along with this is you're getting bombarded with all kinds of information including like resource lists right well if I see another resource list, I'm going to go crazy. I, I want somebody to tell me what I need to know out of that list so I know what to do. So it's, it's a lot about also taking care of yourself so that you can get up every morning and be that resilient person that you need to be at the moment. Thank you. And just to follow up on something that you mentioned, resources. I, I think since uh, March, we've all of us attending five, six Zoom calls uh, in one week where people just talk about resources, right? You should do, you know, there is this article, there is this platform. And at one point, I think we get bombarded by lists and that we really don't have time, first of all, to navigate. And that's uh, one of the things that I think our group here in the Inland Empire has been focusing on. It's really providing our partners and the people that we interact with um, list checklist you know these are the first thing the five things that we suggest you should do and that's kind of what I want to ask next is uh, if, if organizations us included were to 
prioritize uh, an agenda for the next two weeks, three months, six months, from your experience and your work, what would be the top, let's say, four things that organizations should focus on? Uh, Jeremy, because, I, you know, money is on everyone's <laughs> mind and we are, that's the biggest pain. Uh, maybe you can help us figure out, you know, what should we have in mind in terms of like very practical uh, steps that uh, we should follow? Thanks, Mihai. I, I did want to follow up on what Stephen said for a minute. And one of Please. the things I, I've been seeing is that um, people who were able to jump into this and start solving problems right away back in March uh, are now really suffering from a lot of burnout and fatigue. So I, I, I really... I take to heart everything Stephen said because people do really need to take care of themselves. There's only so long that we can operate on kind of emergency adrenaline power, right? And then we start to wear down a little bit. So this notion of self-care is not a, an airy-fairy idea that's out in the sky. It's a very practical idea. We really have to make sure that, that uh, all of us who are trying to do this work in the nonprofit sector are, are, are taking care of ourselves and, and moving forward on in healthy ways. And I think the same, you know, I, I've always believed that an organization uh, works best when its finances are, uh, are very well in order. And in this crisis, we see that even more. Uh, so uh, some practical steps that I, I am trying to uh, do in the organizations I work with uh, are to really understand and have a financial fluency with the organization. Uh, and what that means to me is to drill down on the expenses, to know those expenses. If you're a leader of an organization, uh, it's to actually go through and line item by line item to understand what are we spending money on? Uh, how can we reduce each of those line items? Because money in the bank right now is the safety net that everyone needs. To, to survive if we're looking at that at that 18 month uh, picture. And survival is key here. If your organization is doing great work, which I'm sure it is, we want it to survive. We don't want it to run down and, and go out of business in two or three months from now. So understanding expenses, uh, controlling them to the greatest amount we can, getting rid of extraneous expenses, uh, understanding that P&L, understanding uh, six months out, what your cash flow looks like, trying to stretch that into an understanding of 12 months out. Uh, taking every line item, as I said, expense item, and getting rid of the ones that are not necessary to deliver your services, the ones that we all like, right, that we added on when things were pretty good, we could, we could add something on, well, now's the time to take it away. Uh, and on the other side of it, I would say that um, you really want to understand your revenue sources and you want to start testing them. Uh, out here in California, we're facing a, a significant budget deficit. Uh, it's required by law that our state have a balanced uh, budget, so there are going to be significant cuts. Many of our nonprofits uh, have great uh, grant, you know, get get funds from for services from the state. Uh, we've got to be aware that many of those may go away. So what do you do? You have to plan ahead. You have to start thinking about that. You have to think about how you can preserve some of those revenue source programs. Uh, uh, and and where some alternative sources of funding are. And, and by that, I mean not just looking to protect your, your grants from the state and your service payments from the state, but also to look for donors who might be interested in that kind of uh, uh, program for making sure you're pursuing every grant you can be pursuing right now at foundations, making sure that uh, if you're eligible for the PPP loan, that you apply for it. There's still actually funding available in the PPP program, and I recommend anyone who hasn't done that to go ahead and make the step. It's uh, uh, relatively easy to do now, especially through some of the FinTech sites uh, that we can go through Square and, and uh, PayPal. Uh, and that money is gonna be essential, I think, to operate. They're just coming out with uh, the explanations of the forgiveness, but, but pretty much it's the money you spend on payroll and rent can be forgiven. Uh, there are going to be some changes to that, as uh, perhaps some extensions to that. That's an eight-week forgiveness period now that could be extended. Even this week, they may vote on it in Congress. So I think, to me, uh, having a very tight understanding of the finances of an operation really allows you to 
set yourself up so that you can survive in the very short term and also position yourself for the long term, which I know we're going to talk about a little later. Yeah, and um, we, we have been working on, together with Susie and Jeremy, on some checklists that uh, Christina has, is sharing uh, the, the links to them on, uh, on the chat. So uh, please feel free to uh, go to our website, download this uh, checklist and, uh, and use them. Uh, Susie, there is, a, there is a question from Elizabeth on uh, if we assume 18 months of uncertainty, um, how would you recommend small organization approach their work during this period? And I, I know that you are working with uh, middle-sized organizations, but also very small organizations yeah. that in some cases rely on one donor. And uh, th there are some examples on that. Uh, as part of this environment of collaborations and partnerships, what would be on your, on your list of recommendations for these organizations to consider when it comes to taking advantage or, you know, of other resources that other organizations have? Thank you, Mihai. Good question. Actually, you know, in preparation for this call, I was kind of thinking, what, what have I learned as well, watching all these nonprofits come and ask for help and, you know, um, at different, from small, all volunteer organization, faith-based organizations to large hospitals and who are coming to ask us for some guidance around what comes next. And I think the question really came down to me, like two big things that we're seeing on those organizations that are responding more in a more agile kind of way. One is that they're acting now, right? They're, they are want to protect their organizations and run their organizations with some uh, thoughtfulness like Jeremy was talking about on focusing on their revenue and looking at all the rest. But the other part for me was plan now. Plan, retool your organizations for the future. I think that regardless of your size, it is critically important to start looking at how you can pivot from the work that you're currently doing and look around you for unlikely partnerships, unlikely collaborations to help you do that work. I think um, the other advice that I would give that it seems to be the one that keeps rising to the top of the list for all those organizations that we're seeing do it maybe faring a little better right now, over communicate right, to not just your own employees or your constituents, but to your funders, to the community and the constituents that you directly provide the services for. Um, you know, you need to disregard protocols from small organization or to a large organization around how you usually communicate. This is a time where those kind of rules can't happen. We ourselves at IECC, we're not meeting monthly. We are meeting weekly now because that's what it requires us because everything's so fluid and it moves so quickly every day, like Jeremy and uh, Stephen were talking about, Mihai, you know, every day something's changing at every level. So you have to be able to respond to that. Yeah, thank you, Susie. Uh, Stephen, you know, I think, you know, just S Susie really, I think, uh, summarized the, the biggest challenge. Everything is changing uh, day by day, sometimes hour by hour, and we have the experience of the PPP loans when every couple of hours there was something new. From your perspective, what should, uh, what would you advise nonprofit organizations, mm -hmm. mission-driven organizations to uh, make sure they cover as a their efforts to survive and become uh, sustainable. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so on, on, in my role at the California Endowment and Arcus, I am chair of the Finance and Investment Committee. So money uh, is big on my mind. I just want to emphasize what Jeremy was saying. Um, it, Susie Orman just came out of retirement. And, I, you know, Susie Orman is the guru about how to save money and cut your expenses. And she actually I had to have read our material, I'm sure. <laughs> she's, saying, she's saying, get liquid, get liquid, hold on to your cash and do your cash flow. And do your cash flow out for six months and a year so you can start projecting problems. And, and I, I think that is the strongest advice that we're all looking for. And, and let me tell you, 
both, both the endowment in California and Arcus have both done that themselves even so that we can continue to fund not only at the level we funded in the past, but have emergency money uh, that will not impact our corpus. It, these are huge, huge issues going forward. But I, I want to tell you just a couple of quick stories. So one, one of the things that's happened with us, this group on the panel today, we started a response to COVID in, uh, in mid-March, and this will be our fifth rep webinar we've done. We've done a series about what to do every two weeks in terms of very practical about how to gather up your cash, how to look at your programs, how to communicate with your staff. Susie just hit the high notes too. And, and then we did the loan assistance program, and then we're doing a master class. And so a master class on survival. And we had some people in it recently. One was a, a small program that did direct assistance to women. And uh, the woman who runs it had decided to cancel all their events and just really kind of go into hiding. And she was trying to figure out if they could pay their rent. And the group together uh, in the class said, no, no, don't cancel your events yet. They're too far away and you may want to do them virtually, but reach out to your donors, call them, video them, talk to them and talk to your board and make sure they understand what you're thinking about doing. Two weeks later, we had an update and she said, I call my donors and I've never raised more money. I talked to all of them and they all said, don't stop, they, we need you more than ever. And she said, I didn't talk to all my board members and my board members said they'd help in any way, but they don't know how to raise money. So I brought in somebody to talk to them about how to raise money for peers. This was in a two week period. She was back in the game. We had another program that we worked with. It was a senior citizen, senior center. And they were anticipating, they had about a $250,000 budget. They were expecting a 20%, 30% shortfall. And he had given up on his fundraising and he was trying to figure out what to do with programs because seniors were coming to the center and you had to shut down. So he, the, some reimbursement he was getting, he was not reimbursed. So he picked up the phone and he called every donor he had. He not only made his quarter of a million, he made 30, 40,000 extra and put it in reserve. Don't be afraid to pick up the phone and tell people the truth. Talk to them about where they are. Everybody's tuned into this. And yes, getting food to people, shelter to people will be a priority for other, many folks and money will go that direction but your donors still care about what you do. And sometimes right now, what you do in mental health and childcare, senior care, on and on and on, is more important than ever and your donors will get it. Save the Chimps did an annual online fundraising matching gift program. It was up 40%. It closed two weeks ago and we were up 40%. Don't throw in the towel. People care like crazy. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Jane Justice, who is involved with a family foundation working on building the capacity of nonprofits uh, to effectively deploy the renewable resources of volunteer energy. And I really like how that sounds. Um, and, she, I, and I think she really highlights uh, a very important question how funders and I think you know, both Stephen and Jeremy are in are wearing that hat sometimes because of the organizations that are involved with. Uh, so how funders can be more helpful in partnering with nonprofit organization to build that infrastructure that is necessary to mobilize citizens and uh, engage their support. Right question. Great question. Jeremy, you want to go for it? No, you do it, Stephen. I'll follow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think, I, of course, I, one of the things that I think all of us funders have to do is lift some restrictions on our grantees. We've moved most of our project grants to general operating grants, extended timelines, reduce the paperwork is very important. And, and we know that with our work, like with the master class, we have a funder who is uh, uh, giving us funding uh, part of our program is a technical assistance program to their grantees. So not only are they providing a grant to folks, they're also providing them some free technical assistance so that they're smart about how they use that money. 
and build their infrastructure. The, the, the issue I think you were partly saying was about volunteers and the strength yeah. of volunteers mm -hmm. in the community. And this has been a huge problem for things like senior citizens and food programs and et cetera, because the volunteers disappeared. And so uh, obviously the key is making them feel safe but, but Jeremy, you just did a, a, a big volunteer program for Eisenhower Hospital where you were making uh -huh. 2,000 gowns and <laughs> we were et cetera on an emergency basis. And, and, but your, part of your key was, it was uh, figuring out how to create safety for people so that they could work on that project. So that's kind of a basic thing. But I think your point about how we communicate is key to our volunteers and that we have one strong narrative that's truthful, honest, no, no hidden agendas that we can share with everybody. And we make a point to treat our volunteers with the same respect we treat a long-term employee who we know is an anchor to the quality and the kind of services we provide. Volunteers need respect, they need to be listened to. And so if you're trying to build infrastructure and support uh, organizations to do that, I think the funding that's targeted on that kind of effort, and I wouldn't give it as even a project grant, I'd still give it as general operating, and I would give it to, but, but in the conversation, this is about developing your narrative, doing the communication, building trust, and, and telling them that you need them back, and, and to leverage that through peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, support, because Volunteer groups are often a peer support group for volunteers amongst themselves. Right. Can I follow up for a second? Uh, I think it's a great question. I, I would I would suggest that as you as you as a funder, uh, what I like to do is reach out to the organization and ask them what their real needs are. Uh, I, I'm I'm a, I'm a, a flexible enough organization that. Uh, I can pretty much go out and talk to them about what do you think your needs are? What do you, what would be the best way? What are, where do you need to raise the money? Who do you want to incentivize to come up with money? Uh, Steven teases me a lot, but I do a lot of matching grants because the matching grants are designed to bring in uh, constituents who maybe haven't supported the organization in the past, but it gives them an incentive to jump in. And, and through the work I've been doing the last couple months uh, on providing, um, everything is starts with PPs these days, per, uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, what I found is that just volunteers are so hungry right now for engagement. Uh, and it's, it's a responsibility that organizations have to take to provide a safe environment or a way, a method for them to organize. We did it through uh, lots of, we, we put together a program for gowns for a hospital and for masks for, for kids. And altogether, there's going to be about 35,000 pieces done. And what we've done is have all our sewers are at home, for example. So we created a program where uh, the volunteers can still be at home, still be safe. We organize the pickup and everything else. So I think that a lot of it is actually uh, making sure that we're continuing to engage the volunteers, even if they're not going to be used uh, for the typical volunteer activity that they've done in the past. And until they can get back engaged, helping an organization find that way to make sure that volunteer corps stays engaged and excited and feels uh, necessary. We're, we're privileged. We have Lucy Arnez involved with our project. And um, she regularly does outreaches to the volunteers. She puts together customized masks for them, something to let them really know that we're, we really care about what they do. And I, I cannot tell you the value they've added to this project and to the institutions in, in the Valley. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Susie, you started working with the University of California Riverside exactly on the issue of volunteers and helping students gain experience in the nonprofit sector, but in the same time providing support to the members of IECC. Yeah. Maybe briefly kind of, that, that's, that hasn't been volunteers, student volunteers, that hasn't been an issue that IECC has really focused on until recently, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so, um, the, and to talk about volunteers, the question was excellent. Uh, the reality too here in the Inland Empire, for those of you that are not here from Southern California, but specifically to the Inland Empire, when 67% of nonprofits in the Inland Empire have budgets of less than 50,000, 
most of them are almost all volunteer organizations. That's the reality of the small nonprofits here in our region. With that being said, then we're seeing them disproportionately, you know, and I'm going to go back to your questions, um, Mihai, but disproportionately being um, not having access to the loan programs. Um, you know, there is significant disparity between those that are getting help and those that are not based on their size. And we recognize it as well, even for our own organization, how critical volunteers are to keep nonprofits still filling critical gaps in services here in our community. So the, uh, the idea of having Stephen's question to um, unrestricted dollars is, I can't even say it enough. That's exactly what, what everyone needs. On the side of volunteers for a university and interns, this is relatively new to us, to be very candid. And we've already interviewed several students within the last week. And what we come away from is this incredible um, knowledge that these uh, young individuals have that are bringing great strength and leveraging their knowledge and but also we wanted to make sure that their experience with us was going to be as beneficial to them as it is having them being involved in our projects so this has been a time where we're having to un look at untraditional ways on how to get the work done because funding has been um, you know significantly impacted and the re the reliance or the opportunity to start networking and partnering with students from the universities I think is going to be a wonderful asset for all of us in this in the nonprofit sector here. Thank you, Susie. Uh, there, there is a question that brings back the topic of the board of directors, and all three of you are sitting on boards or engage with your own <laughs> boards. So, how, how well, well, what's the dynamic? consider within your organization and the board uh, within this context. And I, I remember uh, another organization that was part of our masterclass talking about saying that she is shy of reaching out to the board and asking for support. And maybe you can talk a bit about um, how to relate to the board, considering that they have their own personal or professional challenges within this context. Yes, please, Steve. <laughs> so I just went through an exercise with one of my boards that I thought was brilliant, uh, and I, I thought I would just share it with you. So the, the uh, executive staff sent out to the board kind of a memo explaining all of the requests that we're getting today, how strong they were, uh, you know, what we were doing with our current grantees. And so they gave us a series of background and then they had called a meeting at the board and said, instead of us talking about all this stuff and getting you to approve things, we're going to do an open mic and we would like you to address issues that you're seeing and experiencing and tie them back to telling us what you think we need to be watching at the moment and paying attention to. And so rather than uh, a board where you go and just listen to stuff and approve stuff, this was a moment when we each brought our own agendas to the table based on all the stuff that was happening with us in our real lives and with our other organizations were involved and, and we really got to talk about it to each other. And, it, and, and at the end, it all came together and we felt like we had had a real conversation and the, that level of engagement I think was helpful to the organization and it was helpful to us as board members and we felt like we were being listened to and I think often board members don't feel like they're really being listened to they're being told and so I think it was good for us I think it was good for the organization and I think a really healthy exercise to put get kind of all out on the table and let us all talk about everything from social justice to health equity to on and on and on, those things that we're really concerned about, as well as making sure people get food and shelter. Susie, you are sitting on a couple of boards, you engage with different organizations and their boards. What, what have you noticed uh, for the last, I don't know, two months, three months? Yeah, I, and we're seeing, because we work with a collaborative group of different nonprofits, you're kind of getting the two big um, spectrums, the kind of hibernation of boards that they just kind of disappeared right now, or they kind of all just frozen and like, what can we do? Uh, we're seeing some of that. But I think the other ones that were and ones that I participate with, I think you're having a sense of family around what's happening because 
you already have people that are part of your board that, you know, are passionate about your mission, that are, you know, champions of yours um, and the work you do. And I think that in times when things are difficult, it is, you know, like we do with our own families, we kind of but make a space for that, those kinds of conversations. We always start, you know, most of our board meetings with something personal and uh, an opportunity for all of us to share what's happening because we are unique. Each of us on our board has uh, runs their own nonprofit. So they're executive directors or board chairs to their own organizations. And we have to hear that first before we can work on what we're doing. I think the other idea for um, that we advise because we get a lot of questions around that. How can you, can you help me with my board right now? You know, they're really, there's no way they're going to do a fundraiser. There's no way we can ask them for money. And I always say it's better to brag than to beg. <laughs> so brag about the things that you are able to do right now. And you've made accomplishments in the last six weeks. You are still standing here. For some of them, your doors are still open. So tell a story about what is working, right? Make sure you, again, come back to really the reason we're all here are the clients we serve. Elevate those conversations at board meetings. And I would kind of, um, you know, that's, that's the thing that has been a strength for all of us. Yeah, uh, J J Jeremy, I, I, I know, you know, over our conversations mm -hmm. since you know, February, probably, that there is one issue that uh, you bring up that organizations should consider. And Tony is asking a question about hi hibernation as a viable strategy. And uh, can you talk a bit about the options that organizations have now, whether to, uh, you know, close their doors for a while, hibernate or expand or merge with other organizations. What's your take on this? Um, what a complicated question, but it's a great question to ask. And, and I think that, uh, I think, uh, Tony, the question actually was very much directed, particularly at arts institutions. And I think there's a, there's a real issue one has to address, which is um, right now, is there anything your organization can do effectively? Um, is there, is there uh, some way to provide the, the services that is in our mission? Uh, for most theater companies, let's say out here in, in my area, the answer is no. Uh, they're trying a few things, but it's not working very well. Uh, just, I'm gonna go on the arts for a minute. Many, uh, very large, well-funded arts organizations are making attempts at online concerts and uh, presentations. And to be, just be kind of blunt, they haven't worked very well. Uh, and so people are working on it. Uh, people with a lot of money are working on how to make that better uh, and how to get that really going well. So if I say to a local arts organization, uh, maybe you should wait a little bit on that online uh, concert or that online performance because what you don't want to do is deliver a bad product that's going to turn people off and say oh that was awful and and it, what I hear is a lot of people saying that uh, saying that the uh, you know outside of professional studios and outside of professionalism the presentations are not that great so this the kind of maybe learning a little bit from other people who are really well funded and maybe people who are more in the commercial arena as to how to do this online a concert is a better way to go for a local theater company that realistically is not going to be able to open for quite some time, depending on what the, the regulations in a state are. And then you've also got the questions of what your audience is going to feel comfortable with. Uh, and I think the most important thing to that, and, and, and I've, I've made some suggestions to people that the best thing they can do with the PPP money is not to go ahead and spend it in the first eight weeks uh, but to put it in the bank and hold it and understand that it's a loan for two years at 1%. And when you are ready to come back out of hibernation, you've got money that's relatively inexpensive and you can work on paying it back. Uh, so I think it's a, it's, a, it's a balancing act. And I think you really have to go to what is the mission you're providing and are you able to provide it in a good way? And if you can't, back down a little bit and wait. Uh, uh, we're going to see a lot of changes. And I think that we can learn from people. And that one issue I just wanted to circle back with what Susie and Stephen have said about boards and about donors. I think one of the key components of getting through all this is communication. You have to be communicating with your donors, your volunteers, your bankers. I mean, people who used to think a bank was just a place to have a checking account now realize that it's a little bit more. 
you want to be contacting your bank. You want your banker to know you, know your organization, what you're doing. And I think that's a really important part of how we all survive this and move through it is this communication with, with the resources around us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we only have 15 minutes left. And before we open to more questions and to uh, maybe some feedback from Christina as she has uh, the IS perspective, somebody asked in the chat room about evolutions and revolutions. And that kind of brings to me sounds like the future. And the last question that I had in mind for this conversation was really about how bold and how out of the box should organizations can think as they are planning their next steps. They are not thinking for a moment about today and paying, you know, the pay covering the payroll and everything, but they really think about their next steps, about their future and how bold they should uh, think. Is it a revolution? Is it an evolution? What's the best approach considering everything, but also the access to resources and technology, which obviously has become a member of our families. Uh, what, what's your uh, approach to, to the future, for example? Who wants to, to go first? I always want to go. Are you kidding? Yeah. <laughs> you know me. Uh, I, I, this is in our sustainability material where we've done the ebook and the video. We talk a lot about this. And, and so it, I think this is like an, a once in a lifetime opportunity to recreate your organization and in a sense, recreate yourself. What kind of leader do you want to be in the future? Do you want to keep playing the transactional game or do you want to be transformative? Uh, where are you going to land on this? And I think that one of the first questions you've got to ask is what impact you're really having and what really matters and why you're doing it. It has to be a very honest conversation with yourself and your team. And think about what role you're going to play in the future and where you can use your talent and what kind of leader you want to be doing what. I think it's a time to question, ask why constantly, and play some of the what if games, create some scenarios for yourself. But I think it's essential that you really get focused. Uh, so many organizations have tried to do so many things that they're mediocre at all of them and their excuses are not adequately funded. And that's a transactional game. And, and adding to that, if advocacy is not part of your mission or not part of your day-to-day -day work, you're going to be out of business. You do not survive. Because when you look at system change, we've got to have system change and everybody's got to be at the table making a voice about it or we're going to end up just in a depressed economy with cut funding, states going broke, cities going broke, and services being depleted like this. And so you've got to get on the front and raise your voices and, and have your clients, your constituents, your donors raise their voices with you. That's my sermon, I stop. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's such a great one. So I, I couldn't agree more about the advocacy, advocacy component. And to add, I think for me too, is this idea of like um, accelerating through the recovery, right? I think it's important that though that it is requires us to be more flexible about how we operate in the rest and do like forecasting and, and, and um, to build our own resilience. But I think too, it's a time for us to start learning um, a journey to accelerate this kind of critical initiatives that we wanna do and build for our own organizations. I never thought I'd be looking at um, mapping a software through Esri, right, for my work as a nonprofit. But in the last 60 days or 30 days, how would that help us do better, provide services and identify gaps in services, geo mapping, right? But it takes you to stop but also um, take the risks to accelerate what you need to get done because there is no time to wait. That is the other lesson I think that we've all learned is, and this was our first meeting with Steven and the Caravansari project. They came through with this first survival guide and if we would have waited two weeks to start acting on those items that were given to us, it would have been too late 
right? We don't have that privilege right now. And the idea that we have to have a place at the table and a voice at those tables where decision making is being is happening right now, I think for not just the nonprofit sector, but all of us in our communities, it is not the time for us to sit and wait and hope that things will get better. We need to have the voice around what that's going to look like. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, I think it's a great question. I think it's a great time to start looking at very significant change. Um, every organization, I believe, has to be able to look at what's right in front of it. You know, the close up. Uh, the detail of the finances and your survival and exactly understanding what you're offering and what, what it's going to take to be around right now. But at the same time, you want to be able to look a little further away, you know, look, look out a little bit, look more at the environment that you're operating in. And I guess there's a question, I think Stephen asked it in a slightly different way, but, you know, are you providing valuable services in an optimal way? Right? That's a question. And, and you can a director or a president or organization or the heads of organizations can look at it and think about that. And then you'll think about over all the time that you've been providing services, you've seen other people do it, you've seen another environment and you think, wow, there's a way we could do this a lot better. I can get an example. There's a, a senior center uh, out here that, that uh, is much smaller than some of the other ones around it that take up a lot of the, of the donor's attention in this area. And the senior center all of a sudden, senior centers are facing a very different uh, way of operating, right? Because seniors are not coming to the centers. Well, these folks happen to be ahead of the curve on outreach, uh, whether it's through computers or phones, uh, outreach to seniors in their own homes. That's a game changer for them. All of a sudden, they're ahead of the game because they don't have all of the cost uh, with the with the facilities and everything else that's burdening the other senior organizations. Now they have a new way of doing it and they can jump ahead and move more quickly on creating a way of organizing and having communities of seniors coming together digitally, which for the time being, that's going to be the way it is, especially for senior communities. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating, frustrating time sometimes. It's a fascinating time to think about those breakthrough solutions to problems that have we've all been kind of picking at, but now we have such turmoil and such change that we can jump in and try to make some real differences. Thank you. Uh, I think we only have six minutes left. Uh, and before I turn over to Christina, I just want to uh, mention that some of the links to our checklist or the master class have been shared on the in the chat box. Uh, and because uh, the loans are still a huge priority for everyone, uh, together we are putting uh, we are organizing a seminar on Friday, and Christina shared the link as well in the chat box where we will discuss only about forgiveness of the PPP loans based on what what is available uh, so far. So, Christina, thank you again for uh, having us. Uh, if you have any questions or you know feedback from the IS perspective. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been an amazing conversation and I think we've gotten a lot of great questions from everyone. Uh, something that we think a lot about here at Independent Sector is trust. And I kind of wanted to get all of your take on, you know, what kinds of things organizations are really be thinking about when they're, um, you know, wondering if they're going to maintain trust, whether it be from their staff, their board, their volunteers, their donors in the, in the long haul here. Um, so the, any reflections on, on the importance of trust at this time? I can speak to, uh, in terms of collaboration, it is the benchmark of, of making a collaborative work, um, you know, at its best, and also it can be the downfall for an organization. So I think uh, embedded in the trust is, you know, do what you say, or say what you do, and, you know, that whole idea that if I'm going to say we're going to do something, we all have to honor that. And you come in it with the mindset that um, it isn't about we anymore. It has to be about us. The work has to be about us because that's what's being required of us at this time. So I, I can't, um, you know, I wholeheartedly agree. The trust issue is, is compounded across all different aspects of our business right now. Yeah. And it's hard because of the misinformation. And you have to, uh, you know, also attend to that. That sits in the room at every meeting and everything we do becomes somehow uh, some politicalness around it. So it's difficult. Thanks, Susan. Anyone else? 
Tr trust is also a personal issue. Um, we talk about all the professional, you know, behavior and, and standards, but it, trust is a person to person thing. And mm -hmm. it can't be done unless you're trustworthy and you make yourself vulnerable and you try to really put yourself in other people's shoes. And, and I know it, it, we're a really strange group actually to be working together. Uh, and um, and it, it came out of personal trust. We've been, we now, for a number of months, talk, call, call Susie every Monday morning at 10 o'clock and just talk about what's on each other's minds. And, and even more so with Jeremy. And the three, uh, the three groups have really come together and are doing joint planning on how to impact our region. And it's just, um, it, it is all based on trust. So you, you couldn't have brought up a more important uh, topic and research will say it 10 times over, of course. I, I, I think well, what I've noticed, obviously what Susie and Stephen said is, is really true, but I, I think people, uh, or it, especially in this context, people have more trust in you if you see that the organization is going somewhere, is thinking about the future, uh, is trying to test new things. And I think it's also a mix of trust and uh, inspiration and thinking that, uh, you know, th there is a future, uh, they are trying new things, they are thinking out of the box. And I, I think that also has inspires people to, uh, put their trust in people or organizations, you know, they have a vision. And I think that's, that's very important. And I also think building on trust is important in the kind of time when, when you're going to have to make decisions that you may have to change next week, right? Uh, decisions that an organization or people make today that seem absolutely rational and smart and the greatest decision ever. And in a week or two from now, it's no longer an effective decision. Uh, it's not that you went back on your word or you tried to deceive anyone. It's just that you had to change the direction you're going. And I think that can test the boundaries of trust. And it helps if you have a trusting relationship going into it so that people understand. You know, and you're upfront and honest about why you had to make a decision that changed. I mean, everything changes right now. And I think that that trust component is really important. So people have that kind of maneuverability, the ability to maneuver around a little bit in some space. One of the recommendations we constantly make to participants and cohorts in our program is to develop a, your own kitchen cabinet, your own personal board of directors of just two or three people that you can be absolutely honest with and they will be honest back with you and that you can trust each other. This is hugely important, particularly for leaders and organizations who often feel alone and isolated and they really can't share everything with a lot of people because of some of the tough decisions they have to make. So developing your kitchen cabinet or your personal board of directors uh, can be a very powerful tool. Yeah. And I, I know we are almost done, and, but feel free to reach out to us. Uh, I shared our contact at caravansrightproject.org and we'll be more than happy to learn from you, but also share some of our resources and the things that we will learn because it's not over and it will, it will continue. Thank you all so much, um, everyone who's on here. Thank you for sticking with us. And uh, as you sign out, please uh, take the survey so we can know how to uh, provide additional resources like this to you right. in the future and, and additional webinars. Any uh, last words from, from anyone on the panel before we sign off? Well, just thank you. We, we've yep. been part of Caravan's Right Project, has been part of the IS group for a long time, and uh, it's exciting to see that you provide so many resources to your members, but not only. That's uh, very refreshing. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank Have you. a great day. Bye.